skydivers, Alec Pierce, scuba. Stop it, Kevin. I'm trying to be serious here. Uh, we're going to talk about computers again. I know we just did a, a short uh, episode on dive computers a short while ago. And I dealt with, uh, I think, what I think is important information for new divers buying an inexpensive wrist mount and console, oh, lots of air integration, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was a really, really popular episode. Thanks, by the way, for watching and referring. Uh, my tech tips to other divers who may not have heard of it, please do that. And thanks for your comments, too. As a matter of fact, this particular Dive Computers Again episode is in response to several comments uh, that you've sent in. I really appreciate it. It gives me great ideas. It gives me some ideas to whether or not what I'm saying, what I'm sharing with you is of any value. And it seems as if it is. I hope uh, you catch a little tidbits once in a while that might be valuable. Um, uh, I'm no expert, but uh, I have a lot of experience, and if I can help you a little bit in your scuba diving, I'm a hero, to me anyway. So, Thai computers again, what we're going to talk about, a couple of things, two things specifically, but before we do that, I also want to talk about something else. A lot of the responses have indicated to me that they, they, they you know, I, I think I can describe it best as a lack of complete trust in dive computers. Okay. Here we go, guys. 1958, I started diving. We didn't have SPGs. There were no SPGs. We did not have a submersible pressure gauge. We had no gauge that would tell us how much air was left in the tank. We had depth gauges. They were called capillary depth gauges. It's a little plastic tube. And water went in the open end and sort of squeezed the air. You read about it on Google. Go to Google and, 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 and Google capillary depth gauges. That's what we had. They were extremely accurate, up to 30 feet. From between 30 feet and 100 feet, and you had no idea how deep you were. Point is that we had no gauges. When the first good depth gauges and SPGs came along, oh, this is fantastic, that's it. The sport of scuba has reached its zenith. We are happy men. Yeah. And then a little later in the 60s, the first computers, yes, the first computers. I actually did an episode, didn't we, on the vintage scuba, my vintage scuba a playlist about, uh, about vintage computers. And I'll tell you right now that the very first die computers, computers is maybe a very complimentary word, came out in the 60s. And there were lots of them. Some were good. I'm trying to think of one. <laughs> they weren't very good, and they were based on a rather flawed theory. But there were dive computers, and they did help. And, uh, and then for many, many years, of course, we have used dive tables, and in combination with a good watch and a depth gauge, and within reason, uh, most divers were able to calculate their, uh, their, their uh, nitrogen uh, uptake and multiple dives, and we've become accustomed to that. But it has been cumbersome. And it does require regular practice. Every diver for many, many years learned the dive tables based on the old U.S. Navy dive tables from the 50s. They haven't changed much. And they all learned them, practiced them, passed the uh, written quizzes and so on on them. Uh, but I'll bet you a large percentage of divers haven't used them since and couldn't, if you ask them, calculate a couple of the repetitive dives on dive tables. That's the problem with them. You have to use them regularly. And even if you are very, very familiar with the dive tables, you cannot do what a dive computer can do. So so those of you that, that express some some uh, uh, lack of trust in dive computers, okay, okay, I, I, can, I, I can work with that. But don't forget what they can do. They're fantastic. They've made diving so much easier and safer than really, really have. If you feel compelled to carry a spare, if you're absolutely, you know, you're not going to be comfortable unless you have a, a dive gauge down there, hey, go for it. No problem whatsoever with me. However, when new people come into the dive store and I am there and they ask me, I need to get a computer, should I get a backup or do I need to keep my depth gauges? My answer is, you know, it's a personal choice, but no, I don't use one. Uh, the dive computers today, I made a dive computer purchase in the last three, four, five years, not more than five years old. And all intents and purposes is 100% reliable. Now, when I say 100%, you know what I mean. It means that there's no reason for it to fail. They don't fail. Other people said, well, I like my good old analog gauge. You know, I have analog gauges here in my equipment course box <clears throat> that I can take them apart so you can see the inside. If you saw the inside of that analog gauge, you might not be quite so confident. Little tiny gears, little chains. And a little, a little thin brass boarding tube all connected with gears. It's like the inside of a fine watch. Yeah, drop it. It's toast. Yeah. 
for the very least is inaccurate. So please don't be don't fall in love with those Borden two gauges, both the SPGs and the, and the analogs. They were fire from perfect. I have boxes full of busted ones. Uh, uh, so anyway, whatever. It's a very personal thing. Me, modern computer, reliable, accurate, and it gives you more dive time. That's right. Because with the dive tables, it means you're very proficient. It's very difficult for you to calculate the effect on your body, that is the nitrogen uptake effect on your body, for a recreational type dive. A dive where you start at the surface, we all do, go very deep, shallow, deep, shallow, deep, shallow. This is how recreational divers dive. They don't go to the bottom like a Navy diver, do a job and come back up. They go like this all over the place. You can't possibly begin to calculate how much nitrogen your body has absorbed with that type of a dive profile. But a computer can. If you go to 100 feet and then back up to 30, the computer says, hey, you got lots of time underwater. Using a dive table, you're out of there in 20 minutes. 100 foot dive, right? So don't discount them. Use your own personal judgment. Whatever makes you feel good inside, that's what's important. Having a good time and being safe. However, let me, let me talk about dive computers. Now, on that same subject, if some of you do want to have a redundant dive computer, another dive computer, there is a product from Oceanic, one of the top manufacturers in, uh, in, the, in North America. Been around for a very long time, since the 50s. And uh, they also make very, very fine computers, one of the, some of the finest computers in, uh, available. Um, and they have this device called the Bud Backup Dive Computer. <laughs> That's what it is, yeah. And a simple device, clip on your PC and off you go. It's a great little backup if you feel compelled to have that. Now, what's good about the Bud is it's a backup. That's all it is. Relatively inexpensive compared to the price of the computer. I think it's, it might be it might be 200 bucks tops. And uh, you just clip it on and forget about it. Now, if your computer, heaven forbid, your computer actually did fail, pick up your butt. The butt will tell you exactly what's happened on that dive. How deep the dab do and everything. It tells you for one dive only. This is not a full dive computer. No, no, no. It doesn't do multiple dives. It doesn't log dives. It only calculates one dive at a time. That's all you really need. The only dive you really care about is the dive you're on, right? So it's a good alternative rather than spending money for a full feature dive computer. If you are among that group, it feels dive computers uh, still require backups. I have mentioned to many, many people on that topic, should they have dive computers, should they, they, want, to, they want to keep their analog gauges. So do what you feel good, what makes you feel good, how, however you feel safest. It's a moot point. In five years, there won't be any analog gauges. Just a cell phone and computers change and they're gone. I predict in five years, analog gauges will be, they'll be in my, I'll be doing, I'll be doing a vintage episode on analog gauges. I'll be talking about you guys and how you love them. <laughs> hey, we'll see if I'm right. Anyway, I want to talk about two things today that came up in discussions. One of the first things I want to talk about is OLED. What? OLED. OLED. What's that? LED. LED. Most dive computers are LCD. So if you take a little close look here, and you all know what LCD is. LCD means that the screen is an LCD screen, a liquid crystal display screen. Black numbers appear on a white, or in this case, a steel gray background. Okay, and that's what you see. Okay, LED is light emitting diode screen. Let's see what one looks like. Here's a, here's a really nice one, a game from Oceanic. I'm going to turn this on while you're watching, Kevin. People get an eye, what is that? I know, I, I'm going to turn it on while you're watching. Get the camera in here, Kevin. Ready? Okay. So you see the difference? They're LEDs, light emitting diodes, and you actually have them in different colors. So now when you look at this, it's actually a light that's shining into your face. This is a normal screen that you would have. It shows the depth, the time, and so on. Okay? Now, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but while I still have this on, because it's a, I have to get the right sequence of buttons on it, I want to show you something else. If you hold down select for just a moment, it goes to a compass. I'm going to let you zoom in there, Kevin. Can you see that compass in there? And if I turn my direction, you can see how they, it actually shows the degrees of the compass, and it shows an arrow for north and south, and you, you can change that. And you can see it moving a little bit there. So it's actually a built-in compass, because that's the second thing I wanted to share about these dive computers. So let's go back to the LED versus LCD. The LED is pretty. Let's go back to norm again. 
There we go back to normal. The LED is really pretty. Got bright colors. You can go sit in a bar and have a drink, and girls will come over and say, oh, hey, Are you an astronaut? <laughs> or whatever. And this looks great on your wrist. I mean, look at it. Eh? And the colors are good. And it is easy. Now, particularly if you dive, and this has come up in some of our discussions, if you dive in dark water, if you dive mainly in, in fresh water, as an example, if you, if you dive in caves, if you do penetration wreck diving, if you do a lot of night diving, then this, this is the way to go. There's no question about it. Uh, this is excellent, particularly if your eyes are not perfect like mine. However, it's not perfect. First of all, they're bigger, more, more clumsy, cumbersome. Uh, secondly, they're substantially more expensive. Quite a bit more, more than I mean, possibly twice as much. Uh, secondly, they do cost more to service. The batteries are different, and they need service every year. LEDs use more battery than LCDs, right off the bat. Uh, plus, as you know, these have transmitters, so the transmitter needs to be changed as well. The transmitter, in case you're not aware, just sticks on your regulator, and it transmits the air supply, the amount of air in your tank. To the computer. So this computer, when it's working, actually shows air supply where it's flashing down here at the bottom. Um, so they're not, not perfect in, in any, any respect. Now I want to mention about this, this light. People say, oh, it's so nice, so it's nice and bright. Well, when it first went on there just a moment ago, you may have noticed for just a moment you couldn't see the screen. That's right, because the lights that Kevin has set up here to blind me uh, was shown, shown on the screen from, and you couldn't see it. That's exactly the singular, I think the single downfall, other than the fact that it's more expensive and more expensive to serve. You see, if you have an LCD compass, LCD compass like this, okay, they, this is like a watch. Do you remember uh, early digital watches? They had, a, they had a light in them called Indiglow, Indiglow, and it was kind of neat. You push a button and it would light up. And you can see the, the screen behind. Well, these have the same thing. So if you're in a dark situation, caves, whatever the situation, you can press the button and a, a light shows up. And you can see it perfectly well. Because these are based, the, the, the ability to see this screen is based on uh, 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 the contrast between the dark numbers and the light background. Now, if you have a problem seeing it, just shine a light on it. Again, because it's based on a dark letter, on a white background, they show up very, very well. And even if you get a lot of light on these, look, a lot of, well, in fact, the more light you get, the brighter it is. You see how clear it is, a bright, sunny day, wow, that's great. Ah, it's different with an LED. Let me just show you, there we are back to the LED, okay? This is super, if it's dark, if I could get Kevin to turn off the lights in here, you'd see this is great. But watch what happens, watch what happens here. When I shine a light on this, gets harder to read. And on a bright sunny day, sun shining down, you're diving in Key Largo on a bright sunny day at noon, calm day, occasionally that happens in the Keys, and the sun shining down, you're going to have to shield it. Of course, you know this. That's what I know you're going to, I'm going to get comments. Just shield it. So you put your hand around the shield. Well, now you've got a two-handed computer. May not be the best. May not be possible. If you look at the computer for a quick glance and you have to shield it because it's so bright. I'm not making, I'm not saying they're not good. But I just want to point out some of the disadvantages or deficiencies we have found. And there's one of them right there. Not perfect, but nothing is. Nothing is. Uh, my job here is not to tell you what to buy. My job here is, if I can, just to educate you so you can go out and you can intelligently choose what to buy. Not necessarily depend on the store staff. Sometimes their motivations for selling a particular item are not always uh, perfect. Okay, now, second thing I want to show you. Second thing, uh, we've, we've done OLEDs and LCDs and talked about a little bit, okay? Second thing I want to share with you is the compass. Compass, built-in electronic compass. Let me see if I can get this one back here, Kevin. <clears throat> so here's the compass on the LED, light-emitting diode. There's the compass. That's as big as it gets. And you can see it has a traditional compass rose, a circle, with supposedly degrees on it. And you can see at the top it shows the degrees and there's an arrow that points. No, this is very much like a real compass. As you move and face in different directions, it moves a little bit. The number of de degrees, the degrees changes, and, and, and the, uh, the uh, arrow moves around the rows as well. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Keeping in mind on a bright, sunny day and the other limitations we've talked about might be hard to read. But it's a pretty good compass. A nice big screen. That helps a lot. On a more traditional LCD, liquid crystal display, let me see if I can get the compass on this one, Kevin. I think it is select. Yep, there it is right there. 
On this one, it's a little more difficult to read. There's no question about that. <clears throat> uh, this is the Oceanic OCI. The one I use, actually, I like it quite a bit. Tip it back a little bit, Kevin, and a little more light on it. <laughs> Just the opposite of the other one. Huh? So on this one, you can see it's a little bit different. What it has, it shows you the degrees again. It doesn't show the actual rows. It just shows the compass, the, the, the arrow. It doesn't show the whole rows on there, the compass rows. It just shows the arrow. So this particular one shows that I'm going backwards right now. <laughs> Not really. If this was on your wrist and you're swimming, the, the rows points to north. Now you can choose. You can you, The arrow points to north. You can choose what you want. You can have the arrow point north. Or you can have, have the arrow point in your direction of travel at all times. And, uh, and, uh, and you just read which way it is and the, and the number of degrees. So this, the screen is not maybe as big a screen, but because it's been simplified, it's probably just as easy to read. 127 degrees, and I'm going that way. And really, that's all you need. You probably already have discovered, if you are a scuba diver and you've used a compass at all underwater, you've already discovered that underwater compasses uh, are, are not precision instruments. When I was a Boy Scout leader many, many years ago, about a hundred years, I think, anyway, a uh, Boy Scout leader, and we had to teach the, uh, the, the cubs how to use a compass, uh, we really gave them a hard time, and they learned how to, how to be able to walk within a degree or degree and a half out in the middle of a field and find a matchstick. That's what we used to do. We'd go to the golf course and put a match down on the grass, and they had to find that matchstick sticking up out of there. And uh, they were pretty good. You can't do that underwater. Almost impossible. There's simply too many factors, not to mention the fact that you're three-dimensional. There's up and down. Oh, and currents. So it's up, down, left and right, and back and forward, and everything else. And so it's very, very, very difficult, even for a very experienced uh, swimmer. Distance, direction, currents, just too many factors involved. But on the other hand, generally speaking, compasses underwater are designed to get you back to the boat back to the shore, and if the shore runs north and south and you're swimming east and west, you just simply have to swim north and you, you know. So they don't have to have the great precision, the fact that these compasses actually have a degree on there, 360 degrees, or it won't be 360 degrees, but 271 degrees, range. Eh, not really that important. 270 is west, or swimming west is probably close enough. However, there you go. They do have built-in compasses, kind of nice. and the new electronic compasses, again, the computers uh, purchased in the last three or four or five years are pretty good. Earlier ones were not. They didn't work uh, sometimes, uh, depending on the diet gear you had. Some certain areas, this was a strange one, certain areas of North America, the compasses would not calibrate, and you couldn't swim in a straight line with them. It, we would send it back to the manufacturer. It works perfectly. Different part of the country. Bring it back to here and it wouldn't work. So, some idiosyncrasies, but today the compasses are very, very good electronic compasses. Uh, if you're familiar with the nice big wrist compass that you can see really well in the side view, I still really like them. I, I don't carry one uh, very much anymore, but my diving is very controlled now. I don't get into any kind of a, any sticky situations at my age. Uh, so, again, this is one of those areas where you have to make an intelligent decision. And maybe some of these ideas, some of these thoughts have helped you to do that. At the very least, it might direct you as to what to look for, what to research, and help you make your decision. Okay, guys, so I took care of OLEDs and I took care of electronic compasses. Okay? Like I promised. Keep the comments coming. I love them. Alec Pierce, Scuba, Tech Tips.